Um, and I'd like to welcome you to the third workshop for the program on data-driven decision processes on societal considerations and applications. And I wanna give a special thanks to our workshop organizers today. Uh, we have Shuchi Chawla and Irene Lowe and Rachel Cummings. So thank you very much. quick logistics you'll have food provided before the morning talks and in the breaks but for lunch you're on your own um hopefully you brought a little rain gear i don't know if it's going to rain today um but please leave food outside the auditorium and there are lockers on the first floor on the other side of this um partition where you can leave things if you want to um and our videographer, Omid Farr, is going to help speakers set up for their talks. And today's workshop is hybrid. So um, whoever's sharing the session will monitor the uh, Q&A. But if you're in the room, you can just raise your hand and ask a question. And finally, I want to give a special thanks to Ashley Hassan for handling all the logistics for the workshop, uh, including the accommodations for many of our out-of-town visitors. So I'm going to hand it over to the capable hands of Irene, who will introduce you to the workshop. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for being here and for your patience as we work through the technical difficulties. We are super excited for the program that we have prepared for this week. Uh, just to give you a little heads up for where we're going, today we're going to see a bunch of talks uh, generally in the topic of privacy, tomorrow generally in civic participation and districting, and on Wednesday and Thursday we'll see talks on fairness, interpretability, and, and applications particularly to healthcare. Uh, so we're really excited for all the speakers. In addition, we also have a couple of you know, special afternoon sessions. So today we are gonna have a panel in the afternoon on bridging from academia to practice, particularly in public sector and nonprofit settings. Tomorrow we will have a poster session where a lot of students and postdocs and other researchers have submitted some really exciting posters. So we encourage you to participate. You can go upstairs um, to the second floor. Going back to the panel, we will have an opportunity for people to submit questions. So we do ask that you please uh, submit questions uh, to us ahead of the panel. So the panel will be at four. So if you can submit your questions by about two o'clock, that will be great. I'll um, shortly after in one of the breaks, put up the email to which you can submit your questions on the whiteboard. So just email them in and our moderator Vahide will look at those ahead of time and select some to ask. In addition to those, we also have a reception that's happening tonight from six to seven. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for that. That's one place where we can all kind of mingle and chat. Oh, five to six, excuse me. Uh, and we'll also have um, on the last day, uh, we'll close out the program with a discussion and open problem session. And so if there are any topics that you would like to discuss during that time or any kind of directions, thoughts that you have sparked, um, you know, maybe even somewhat concrete open problems that you want to discuss, feel free to just let us know. You can email us or come find one of the organizers. Okay. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to welcome up Christina Elvento without any further ado to give our first presentation of the day. Oh, and just um, one moment before we clap, sorry. Um, for In terms of timing, since we are starting quite late, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to eat 15 minutes into the next break, um, but then we'll extend the break by about five or 10 minutes. So for that break, you'll, be, you'll have about 20 minute break, just listen for the bell. And so let's welcome Christina. I have a microphone. Could you let me know if, it, if it's working? Can you hear me well? All right. Thank you so much for, for the introduction. Again, I'm Christina Lavento. I am the product lead for measurement in the privacy sandbox at Google. Um, and I want to say a huge thank you to the organizers for inviting me uh, to this workshop. Um, I find these types of workshops really energizing, the intersection of industry and academia. Um, it really allows me to wear both of my hats in one talk, which is very exciting for me. Um, and what I'm hoping to kind of chat about for, for about the next hour, although Irene, please, you know, wave hands if I, if I need to wrap it up sooner, um, is how we're approaching privacy safe measurement on the web and some of the open questions that we're running into um, in our work in the, in the privacy sandbox. So as a quick overview, I'll, I'll start with what is the privacy sandbox? Why are we doing this? Um, and then I want to spend the majority of the time on some of the measurement proposals that we have in the privacy sandbox. Um, and as we go through these, I'm going to raise a bunch of open questions. Uh, this is not a talk where I'm going to give you really very many answers at all, although I'm happy to take questions in the talk and, and clarify anything. 
Um, this is really a, a talk that's intended to raise some of the places where, where we don't quite know what the right path forward is, where the direction is still maybe a little unclear, or we have goals that are in conflict with each other or in tension with each other, maybe I should say, instead of conflict. Um, and I'll wrap up with um, uh, a little bit of cheerleading, a little bit of uh, hopefully generating some excitement for how you can participate um, and how you can get involved in Privacy Sandbox in, and in these types of open web initiatives. Um, I think it's an area where a lot of people don't realize how open these processes are, um, how much room there is for participation, both from industry and academics. Um, so I'll, I'll hopefully wrap up with, with a little bit of, of uh, inspiration on, on how you can get involved if you so choose. And I hope you do choose. Um, all right, so with that, oh, sorry. If you have any questions, please do feel free to, to raise hands. Um, I'm happy to take questions during the talk. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll make sure that we, we leave some time at the end for any you know, questions, discussion, comments. Uh, so please, please don't hesitate to interrupt, particularly if any of the, the fun jargon from ad tech is unclear. All right, so let's get started with an overview of the Privacy Sandbox. So the Privacy Sandbox um, is uh, both for, for web and Android, although I'll admit my talk today is gonna have a little bit of a bias towards web. That's where, mo where more of my experience is. Um, but really what the Privacy Sandbox is, is a common vision to improve user privacy while sustaining healthy web and mobile ecosystems. And so what this takes is a collaborative approach with publishers, brands, ad tech, privacy advocates, fairness advocates, and others. Um, and so what is the Privacy Sandbox? Well, the Privacy Sandbox is really a set of common technology proposals across web and apps for critical advertising use cases that support the open web, particularly things like ads measurement um, and improving ads relevance. And uh, as uh, just a quick reminder, I work most on the measurement side, so we're going to be talking largely about measurement today, um, although happy to answer questions about relevance if, if they come up um, or to kind of point you in the, in the right direction. So uh, the Privacy Sandbox for the web right now is available for testing through Chrome Origin trials, um, and we expect to have this available for testing in a beta uh, for Android soon. So I've, I've said, you know, maybe this feels a little bit corporate-y, a little bit like uh, here is our motivation for this wonderful project. But really, I think if, if you're wondering kind of why, why care about this at all, other than, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to work on things related to privacy, really the underlying motivation for Privacy Sandbox when Privacy Sand Sandbox started several years ago was concerns about cross-site tracking. And I expect if you've heard about Privacy Sandbox before, it's probably in the context of Chrome deprecating third-party cookies. Um, but I think it's, it's really a broader mission than that. One of the challenges that we have with the open web and some of the underlying technologies that have powered things like ads and ads measurement on the open web is that they allow for pervasive cross-site tracking. They create persistent identifiers that follow you across sites, that follow you between apps. And what's really challenging is that the ecosystem has developed a reliance in some sense on these cross-site identifiers. So really the way that I would characterize the privacy sandbox is it's trying to break the reliance on these persistent identifiers and instead move us towards purpose-built, privacy-preserving privacy -preserving solutions for critical ads use cases. So I'll talk about kind of two, two methods for, for cross-site tracking, and we'll get into a little bit more detail on this in a couple of slides. But really, there's kind of two, two big areas that, that at least that I think about. So the first are, are things like third-party cookies or kind of platform-supported um, uh, persistent identifiers. If you're not familiar with what a cookie is, it's, it's really just a file that's stored in your web browser. And the, that file can be read and written in different contexts across different sites. And what that allows for is storing a persistent identifier for a user or potentially some additional information about them that can be accessed across different contexts, across different sites. So if you've ever wondered you know, how a pair of shoes can follow you around the internet, it is many times uh, the result of a third-party cookie. But third-party cookies are, are not the only way that this type of tracking can happen. Um, covert tracking, so this is things like fingerprinting, um, is another um, kind of challenging uh, issue that's, that's cropping up. Um, and essentially what this is, is combining pieces of data. So perhaps looking at your IP address combined with the languages that are installed and your browser operating or your browser or your operating system um, and using that to kind of create a fingerprint for a user that again, still follows them where they're going on the web, which does still allow kind of this pervasive cross-site tracking. So really um, our goal with Privacy Sandbox 
is to introduce new privacy preserving technologies. And I'm gonna talk primarily about measurement technologies today while we phase out third-party cookies and also work on other proposals to, to combat covert tracking. So anti-covert tracking efforts. Um, so this is not something that you know, Google is doing alone. This is not something that is a you know, specific project that it, just Google is participating in. This is really an ecosystem-wide effort. Um, and our goals really in the Privacy Sandbox are not just that we get to a more privacy preserving future, but that we get there in a collaborative way that is balanced and has room for improvement over time. I don't expect that we're going to go from today to the perfect future in one iteration. This is going to be something that we will make compromises along the way, we will make improvements along the way. And really what I'll, I'll kind of wrap up the talk with is, is more on this kind of collaborative nature of the Privacy Sandbox. Um, the Privacy Sandbox is developed in the open. You can see all of our proposals on GitHub. You can comment on them. You can raise issues. You can join us in open calls on the W3C. Um, we're on calls every other week at a minimum for measurement. Um, so I really, I'll, I'll wrap up with, with a bit more detail here, but this is an, an effort that is not, you know, one browser, one, uh, one browser vendor, one operating system alone is going to push forward. It's something that requires the participation of the ecosystem. Okay, so now let's get into the fun stuff, which uh, is the measurement proposals and, and I'll raise some open questions here. And um, again, please, please don't hesitate to, to interrupt me with questions as they come up. So let's start with a little bit of motivation for why measure. One um, kind of question that is, is very natural is, okay, these third-party cookie things sound pretty invasive. You know, why would any, what legitimate purpose could you possibly have? for these cross-site identifiers. So I'll try, you know, with a little bit of, of my ads background to, to make a case for why measurement is actually important for, for the open web. So why do we measure? Well, advertisers want to measure because they want to know that they're spending their money effectively. When you're buying ads, you want to be sure that those ads actually like fulfilled the purpose that you bought them for. Did more people actually purchase your products because of those ads? Were you able to reach the audience that you wanted to reach, even if you're doing something like a public service announcement? You want to know that you actually reach the audience that you were trying to reach. Furthermore, when we think about the open web, publishers rely on ad revenue to power their sites. Go ahead. Go ahead. Great question. So someone's asking, what, what does publisher mean? Uh, and this is a bad habit I have of using too much jargon. So in this case, we mean basically anybody who's running a site. So you can think about this as a news site, uh, as a, um, a blog, really any, anywhere where you're kind of publishing content, where you're creating content and that's supported through ads. So those publishers are relying on being able to prove that, hey, the ad slots on my page are, are valuable, that this is not something scammy where the ad isn't even showing on the page. It's something that actually is, that I have a relevant audience for the type of ads that you're trying to show and the ads that show on my site are valuable. So publishers rely on this ad measurement. They wanna be able to know an ad showed on my site, did it actually do anything? And finally, ad techs, and uh, I'll uh, anticipate the question here, what is an ad tech? This is really anyone who's providing technology both as a seller, so someone who's actually helping publishers to sell their inventory, or a buyer, somebody helping advertisers to actually purchase that inventory that's available. So all of these ad tech companies also want to optimize and improve their ad performance. They're not interested in showing ads that you don't actually want to see, that you won't engage with, that don't actually drive value. So measurement actually fulfills kind of like a nice virtuous cycle here, where if you're able to measure the performance of ads, you're able to actually show better ads and power more of the open web more efficiently. So some of the example use cases that we have in measurement are really, you can kind of boil them down to reporting and optimization. So oftentimes you want to be able to publish a report, you know, how much, you know, what type of return did I actually get on my ad spend? So how many dollars in purchases did I drive? And you also have optimization use cases. You want to actually learn a model to determine what ads should I show when. Now, the good news for all of us with, with some, some privacy background here is that those goals are actually really well aligned with privacy at, at a fundamental level. We, if we set aside the technology that's used to do this today, we're interested in patterns that are large enough to actually impact your business decisions. You don't want to change your business decisions based on one person's behavior. And you would prefer really that your models be robust outliers. You don't want to learn models that completely dependent on what, whether one person purchased an item after they saw an ad. So at a baseline, what I, I hope we're, uh, I've, I've maybe made a somewhat compelling argument for is that there are good reasons to measure the performance of ads, to measure ads. And those measurement goals are actually not misaligned with privacy. 
a lot of what, what we're trying to do here can be done in a private fashion. And really the challenge that we're going to run into is how it works today, what the underlying technology is and how we can transition that to a more privacy safe technology going forward. So let's start with a, a very oversimplified uh, model of um, kind of the web platform and how this might work today. So how this works today is if you have someone browsing across the web, maybe they are on a publisher site where they see an ad for a pair of nifty shoes, maybe they click that ad and end up on a retailer site and then make a purchase, or maybe they just view the ad and they remember how nifty that pair of shoes was a week later, and then they go to the retailer site. So how is that measured today? Well, today that's measured through a third party cookie. So that's that again, that persistent identifier that every time an ad tech has for example, JavaScript on a page, that cookie is passed along with a view ping. So if you show an ad and then you ping the ad tech server, you send a cookie along with that saying, hey, this was Alice, she just saw an ad. When Alice later purchases something, again, you can have a conversion ping where an, uh, a request is sent again to the ad tech server with a third party cookie. So you're able to link up that behavior. Now, what's nice about this is that you can measure a lot of stuff. You can measure uh, to a high degree of fidelity, you can get a good sense of what is going on. And now one of the, well, the challenge, of course, with that is that once the cookie kind of leaves the browser, there's a great deal of enhancement that can happen to that cookie. So it's not just kept within the scope of your web browser. A cookie can be stored on an ad tech server or, or a third party server and potentially matched, potentially matched across your devices, potentially matched with your email. And so what this, the kind of challenge that we have here is that while the initial use case sort of made sense, once you start enriching a third party with other data sources, you can really start to micro target and really aggressively target people. And they've also fully lost control of the information about them, right? If you have this information living on a server, which is then joined, let's say you join cookies across someone's phone and their, their desktop computer, that join is now out of their control. There's not a thing that they're going to be able to do to, to unjoin that. So the challenge we have here is that yes, it, it's nice for ads measurement, but there's also many other kind of unintended side effects that can that can happen here. Um, I'm surprised someone hasn't asked this, so I'll ask it. Why don't you just get rid of them? Why don't you just get rid of the third party cookies? And the answer isn't just, oh, but I'd really like to measure ads. So the answer is that removing third party cookies does not actually solve this problem. Um, and so when we think about what would it, what would happen if we just took third party cookies away right now? turn them off with no notice. Well, uh, the challenge we'd have is that there are alternative identifiers. So while third-party cookies are, are problematic in the sense that they can be sent off of the device, they can be linked and enriched with other information, in some sense, they were at least on about, honest about what they were. Right? There was this cookie that was in your browser. You could have deleted it at some point. Um, I don't want to claim that you know, somehow a lot of people are doing that and that they have full control over it. But there was, you know, at least it was sort of honest about what it was. But one of the challenges is that like this use case of needing to measure, of wanting to measure doesn't go away if third party cookies go away. So what can happen is that alternative identifiers, so these, these are actually, there are some proposals for alternative identifiers in addition to things like fingerprints can now be used for kind of the, the same purposes. Now I, I would claim that these are gonna have lower fidelity, but at the same time, they're also gonna have even less user control and less transparency. There's gonna be less that we can do about it. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to articulate my question, but go for it. I want to. It seems like there's a tension between what you've just said and what you said a second ago, which was that uh, measurement, the problem of measurement for ads, uh, and what we need to power the ad ecosystem, is it is in line with privacy. If that was true, just uh, sort of on its face, then there would have been no sort of uh, forcing function over the last 20 years to develop all this more invasive, more granular, micro-targeting, individualized tracking. So I, I, I guess the, the, the story you've just said is that if we get rid of third-party cookies, there will be fingerprinting. And if that's true, then clearly there's some, you know, strong business incentive to individualize uh, tracking in a way that is incompatible with privacy. So how do I resolve that with what you said a second ago, which was that measurement and privacy are completely aligned goals? That, that is a great question. And um, 
I, and I think you articulated it really well. Hopefully everyone also heard the, heard the question on the, the Zoom. Okay, great. So I don't, I don't need to repeat it. Uh, yeah, I know. Let's, let's not go there. This is a great question. So like the, the crux of this question is if you know, measurement is so great and it's totally fine, why would anybody fingerprint? You know, what would you need to do? Why would you need to do this? So what we'll talk through a little bit is, so if you look at the way that this system works today, Basically what's happening every time a cookie is leaving the browser is that there's some log event, there's some event that the ad tech is storing, and then they're running a matching pipeline later across all of those events. It's extremely convenient to do it that way, right? You don't need to know what you're measuring up front. You don't need to think about this. You just slurp up everything and then you deal with it later. So while I would argue that the measurement goals are well aligned with privacy, we all have the human tendency to push it a little too far and particularly on the targeting side, that can go quite a bit too far. On the measurement side, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples of this. And th these are some pieces of feedback that, that I've gotten from people in the ad tech ecosystem. I need to be able to report to my customers the exact number of conversions driven by ads per hour. Why? Uh, unless it's Black Friday, what, why are you doing that? What, it, what is the actual purpose of that? And a lot of it can be because my boss has gotten really used to me being able to do that because I've been able to do that in the past. Was it statistically meaningful? Absolutely not unless something's broken, in which case you've got better ways of detecting if something is broken. But the, part of the challenge here is that because we have been able to measure unlimited amounts all of the time, we've gotten a little bit kind of dependent on being able to do this in a somewhat lazy fashion, instead of thinking in advance about what is it that we're really trying to measure, what really are our goals. I would argue that that has introduced an efficiency into, into ads. It actually has not made ads better to be able to kind of turn back and forth between different strategies. But it is a great question. And I think it also speaks to kind of this, this ecosystem concern of, hey, there's clearly demand for this. There's clearly a need for it. How is it that you know, even if we do think it's aligned with privacy, even if we do think we can do this in a responsible fashion, how are we going to move an ecosystem along with us? It's a great question. And I'll, I'll come back to it again a couple of times in, in the talk. Hi, thanks. Um, do you mind going to the next slide? So yes. I, I think I'm possibly the least technologically adept person at Simon. So I just want to understand. So these things that you describe, to what extent are they sort of in control of, say, Chrome or, you know, my operating system? So what I mean is, could Google in principle stop, um, you know, maybe third party apps from using any of these things? Um, if they wanted to. So I use Brave, which I'm told by my very technologically adept colleagues is really cool. And I sort of think they, they presumably deal with not just cookies, but maybe other stuff like mm -hmm. that. But sort of to what extent, you know, you have control over these things and to what extent you, you don't really is the question. This is an excellent question. And this comes back to kind of anti-covert tracking efforts. So I'll give one example of something that it's, it's rather hard to get rid of, um, which would be an IP address. If I'm going to be sending packets across the internet, I do, I do sort of need to know where they're going. Now, VPNs can help with this. There are other ways that you can try to kind of pool IP addresses together. But a number of these signals, you know, the languages that you have installed, let's say, are kind of important if you need to actually display something in the correct language, the fonts, things like that. Now, does that mean every web request should be a complete free-for-all where all of that information is sent all the time? Probably not. And there we do have a proposal for kind of saying, hey, really only request this stuff when you need it. So there is certainly a very important sister body of work going on right now to try to kind of plug some of these fingerprinting holes. I strongly suspect that this is going to be a long-term challenge, uh, that there are, are likely to be many things that we actually do want to be kind of interesting and unique about different, different people's machines. But I, it, that doesn't mean it's completely hopeless. It doesn't mean we can't make progress. I think we can. And actually, I'll come back to this in the end of the talk, which is that a lot of these questions really kind of come down to sequencing. Because while I've talked about bad things that can happen with fingerprinting, there are some good things too. Very likely your credit card company uses this to know, is it really your device or is this some other person who's actually trying to impersonate you? So it's not 100% bad 100% of the time. There are some spam and fraud use cases that take advantage of this existing as well. And I think uh, Aloni's question is really very prescient here hey, like, why, why, why would you have all this stuff if it's really so evil? The challenge is there are very legitimate uses for this type of fingerprinting as well as third-party cookies. So the challenge that we have really is can we come up with suitable alternatives for these legitimate use cases in a way that is responsible and, and doesn't get us into, into too much of a bind? 
Um, so hopefully that helps and, and we'll come back to this later, but, but please do, do bring it up again. Um, hello, I have a question that maybe is uh, very obvious to sort of privacy people, but can you just elaborate a little bit more on like the, the harms of the status quo? Is it that like if you're collecting very granular data on everything, you're very susceptible to data breaches? Like, can you just elaborate that on a little bit? A, a little bit? What a great question. And I strongly suspect in some of the, the talks on fairness later this week, uh, someone will give a more eloquent answer than I'm about to give. Um, so maybe let me give an example of cross device. You have maybe a work phone, a phone that's provided by your work, and you have a personal computer. And let's imagine you make the mistake of you know, signing into a site once on your work phone with your personal email account. Someone can now match these two devices together. They know they both belong to you. Who has access to that? Do you know? Are you sure? Probably you don't. Um, and the, the challenge is that a lot of this can be bought and sold. Um, so a lot of this type of data can end up in places you did not expect it to end up. And that is really the challenge with these persistent identifiers making it out of the device, right? One is, once it is sitting in someone's third party server somewhere, it is very challenging to claw that back. And it is very easy to link that up with other data sets. So really, I would say that the primary concern here beyond, you know, I, I think we could certainly talk about the, the harms of kind of micro-targeted advertising. Uh, I, I'm not the, the most qualified to speak on that, but I think to, to me, really the biggest concern here is that you have this really juicy way of linking up someone's behavior potentially across many devices in a way that they have limited visibility into and control over. Um, so that really puts, puts the consumer, puts the user at a, at a substantial disadvantage when someone comes back later and says, well, you know, maybe your credit score should be lower because I see that you have this other device where you did this type of browsing. Um, you're not going to have great visibility into that. Uh, it, that can be potentially very challenging. Great question. All right. So these are excellent questions, but thank you for asking them. Um, I think where we had sort of left off was, hey, if we get rid of these third-party cookies, we're going to have a we're going to have a tough time claiming that somehow we we did some amazing thing for for privacy all on its own. If the whole ecosystem then just turns to fingerprinting, so what are we thinking about doing in the privacy sandbox? So what we're thinking about are purpose-built platform APIs to solve some of these use cases. Um, I'm primarily going to talk about measurement, but there are also proposals for spam and abuse, for relevance, for things like federated login, um, and you can find all of that on, on privacysandbox.com. We have links for all of those proposals. Um, and largely what we're planning, what we're kind of proposing to do here is instead of having a cookie, having a persistent identifier leave the device with every interaction with an ad, with every conversion, Instead, we're proposing to do platform mediated measurement where we're linking up those events on the device. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. I'm going to talk specifically about attribution reporting today. So that's attributing conversions to ads that the, previous, that the user previously saw. So essentially how this works is that when a user um, sees an ad or clicks an ad on, on a publisher site, the ad tech, so whoever served the ad, is going to register that event with the browser. They're going to say, hey, Dear browser, I just served up an ad. Here's some information about it. Later, if the user actually engages with that advertiser site, maybe they make a purchase, um, the ad tech, again, is going to register a conversion with the browser and say, hey, browser, I just saw a conversion that might be relevant to one of my advertisers. I don't know if I've shown an ad before, but if I have, please match it. Then what the browser is going to do is actually take care of that matching um, and report that back to the advertiser with delays, with noise added, basically with a layer of privacy protections included, and with rate limits, there are limits here, um, to help provide information about how, how well are the ads performing, but not just handing over everything all the time with a persistent identifier. So in this API, we actually have two different report types, and this is where a lot of our, our open questions will come in. So we have event level reporting. This is being able to say, here's a specific ad event, did it convert or not with some noise? So very coarse conversion information. It's not the whole purchase value, everything about that conversion, but kind of a coarse noisy signal on did it convert or not, as well as summary reporting, which is kind of thinking about larger slices, but providing potentially more detail. So per perhaps a total purchase value for a campaign or a campaign in a particular geography. So let's have a, have a quick look at event level reports before I raise some, some open questions on it. Um, for I, I realize we have kind of a, a mix of folks in the audience. 
So none of the specific things are terribly important on this slide. It's really the flow here that matters. So um, what the flow that essentially happens here is when there is an ad interaction, so an ad view or a click, the ad tech is going to register a source. And in the source, they're going to include an event ID. So this guy here is an event ID that's assumed to be a unique event ID. Um, and they'll tell us how long they actually want to want this to stick around. This is in seconds, and I can't remember how long I made this for, but I think maybe two weeks. Um, and then when a conversion happens, they will register a trigger. So they'll do a trigger registration to say, hey, this thing converted, and maybe it was a, a purchase conversion type. So there's a very coarse conversion type with some trigger data. I am glossing over many details that we try to provide to ad techs to let them prioritize different conversions. Um, but essentially what this turns into is a report that is sent back to the advertiser with the same event ID um, and the trigger data, but the trigger data is noise. So this whole report is actually run through randomized response. This whole thing is randomized response. Um, and I can't remember the order of my slides. Uh, okay, so before we get into to randomized response, I'll give a quick refresher on differential privacy. I, I'm expecting we have a, a mix of half and half on people who are like, move on Christina and people who have not maybe not seen this before. So differential privacy is a mathematically rigorous foundation for private data analysis. Um, and essentially what DP is, is it basically says, if you're going to run a mechanism on some private data, it had better be the case that the probability of any outcome of that mechanism does not change too much if one person changes their data within the database or if one person is added or removed. And one thing that it is worth kind of looking at um, and very uh, fortuitously, I had already bolded adjacent databases. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about adjacency and what adjacency makes sense for these use cases. Often we think about a person in or out. In some cases, we're gonna be thinking about an event in or out. Is that acceptable? That's, so that's an open question I wanna pose. But randomized response, if you're not familiar, is, is a differentially private mechanism. And essentially the way that it works is we're going to provide plausible deniability to whoever is responding to this. If they have a single yes or no answer, we're going to provide them plausible deniability by asking them to flip a coin. If it's heads, they're gonna tell us the truth. If it's tails, they're gonna flip a second coin and tell us the result of that coin, coin flip. You know, heads for yes, tails for no. So um, what's nice about this is while randomized response is very simple, it's nice to explain to people. They kind of get, oh yeah, it's 50% you know, probability this is just the outcome of a, of a coin flip. Intuitively, it's nice to explain. Um, it's also relatively straightforward to extend this to different privacy parameters. If you don't want a fair coin flip, you want to, to bias that coin flip. Um, and you can also extend it to larger outcome spaces, which is in fact what we will need to do for our purposes. So when we randomize response, this attribution report, we're looking at the entire outcome space of all of the, the trigger data that we could have um, provided, which can mean no trigger data, that no trigger happened. So every time an ad tech is actually registering a source with us, we are flipping coins in the background to say, hey, should we pretend a conversion happened? So what's nice about this is that we, we do have actually the right structure in place to provide some pretty reasonable privacy protections. But beyond that kind of, hey, we could make this DP with nice parameters aspect of this, there are some very nice structural limits that come along with this proposal. There's no cross-site identifier. There's no identifier that is shared across sites that's sent to multiple places. There's an event ID only, and that's only on one of the sites. Um, for views, we provide at most one bit of metadata and one conversion per view. So compared with today, where you can measure an unlimited amount of metadata for an unlimited number of conversions basically forever, now you only get at most one bit of metadata, one conversion um, for a, a more brief period of time. Yeah, Rachel. Um, what is the one bit that you get? Is it whether it was shown or not? Excellent question. So you both, so one way to think about this is, is it's really two bits. It's did it convert or not? And then conditioned on it converting, you get one bit of metadata. So what I suspect most ad techs will end up using is was this a purchase or was this some other kind of positive signal in the funnel that the, the uh, person was moving towards a purchase? So they can choose what that one is. Yes, that's a great question. And, and really we are trying to leave the, the choice of the metadata up to the ad tech. This is not something that the, that the platform is really dictating. So for views, one bit of metadata, one conversion. For clicks, three bits of metadata, three conversion. So substantially more information for clicks, still much more limited than third-party cookies. But in this case, there was actually a user gesture. The user did in fact say, hey, like I saw this ad and cared about it enough to click on it, which is a substantially better signal. There's much more kind of natural rate limits that come along with clicks versus ad views. 
you might have scrolled past that ad had didn't even process it at all. So there are different limits there. Um, we also have a, a Christina, here's a question from the Zoom. Yeah. Um, the question is, does all this assume the user is not regularly clearing cookies in history? That's a great question. So um, both for attribution reporting, our, our API proposal, as well as cookies, you can clear your, your browsing history, you can clear your cookies. And the same is true for the, for the type of, of data that we're storing here. So if you were to, let's say, visit a site and a source was registered, and then you cleared that site data, that, that source would go away in the same way that, that a third party cookie would go away. I hope that answered the question, but, but if not, we, we can certainly come back to, to a follow-up. Um, and uh, I, I do think it, it's, it's important to remember that, that most consumers, uh, I mean, the, the joke that we kind of have on our team is, you know, on, on Thursdays, we clear our browser history. That, that doesn't tend to be like a, a common, you know, consumer pattern. So, um, right. So really the, the nice thing that we have about these event level reports is there are some nice structural benefits in addition to the potential for adding noise, potential for adding enough noise to, to have kind of more meaningful privacy protections. Now, to, to Aloni's early question, are these useful? Is, is this worth doing? Is this enough information or would someone just fingerprint anyway? Well, there are a couple of you know, good signals and bad signals here. So first, um, what's really nice about this is when you think about having an event ID, you can go ahead and store that event ID in your logs as an ad tech and do later exploratory analysis. If you don't know which features you're thinking about for your ML model yet, that's fine. You didn't have to know them at source registration time. As long as you logged them properly, you could do this exploratory analysis later. So it's, it's very nice in that sense. It kind of matches this existing way that people tend to think about having logs, having event IDs, processing them later. So it fits very nicely with that. So in that sense, it's quite useful. Um, and the other thing that we do here is that we're splitting privacy budgets per ad tech to kind of prevent any sort of interference. So when you think you're measuring something, you are in fact probably measuring it. It's, it's very unlikely that somebody else can interfere in a way that would, would mess up your measurement. Um, uh, module, of course, if the user clears their data, they clear their data. Um, challenges. Um, some of the challenges that we've heard um, are adapting systems to delayed conversions. So what should I do if my pipelines today are assuming that every time a user is really converting, I'm getting that real time versus delays on the order of several days, potentially on the order of several hours. So that is, that is certainly a practical challenge as well as noise correction methods. While all measurement today is noisy, you know, clearing history is, is a great example of, of an introduction of, of noise. Um, it tends to be noise that we try to ignore and pretend doesn't exist, or we model like in very general terms. Whereas in this case, we're telling you, this is exactly the noise that we applied. Here's how you should correct it. That, that's a very kind of different way of thinking uh, about data collection. And if you're curious to see kind of more feedback that we've gotten in these proposals, um, you can uh, see it on Privacy Sandbox, or sorry, this is developer.chrome, uh, Privacy Sandbox feedback. Um, there's this great place on the internet where you can search for these terms and it will come up. Um, but we do provide quarterly summaries of, of all of this feedback if you're curious to kind of hear more about how, how this has been going. Um, there are a bunch of open questions here. So the privacy bar, what notion of adjacency should we be using? Right now we think about this from an event level perspective. We think about you know, for this particular ad event, am I giving plausible deniability about whether, whether it converted or not? And in conjunction with rate limits, that's, you know, probably helping quite a bit, but it's not the same thing as what we might intuitively think about when we think about user level privacy guarantees. Furthermore, this happens over time. This may happen many times for a particular user, even for a particular publisher and advertiser pair. So what is the right privacy bar? What are the right parameters? How should we think about parameters when in the worst case, everything is the same? Um, how do we think about reasoning in, in those spaces where we know we want to do better, um, but it's, it can sometimes be challenging to reason about things when worst case kind of looks the same. Um, there's also a lot of kind of interesting problem structure here. Um, event IDs are extremely convenient, right? We talked about how it's nice to log those, but they also make it impossible to just apply shuffling and get any privacy amplification straight out the box, which is somewhat disappointing, right? You might hope that because there are many ads being shown that you could actually really take advantage of scale here, that this is something that could help you, but it doesn't quite fit with the way we've got the problem structured today. There are also a lot of interactions between different parameters, priority in, in the API that makes it challenging every time someone makes a feature request to us. We have to think through very carefully how this impacts and, and interacts with all of those different features. So it's not something that 
is quite always straightforward to reason about how a, a given request will impact the privacy properties of, of the API. Sorry, I lost track of requests here. Is that request for? Uh, so like a feature request. So we, we talk about this in public. Um, so often we'll, we'll get requests from, from ad text. Let's say, um, there's a recent one. Um, a recent one supporting multiple domains. Oh, so okay. if you have, uh, let's say you have an advertiser that has myadvertiserblackfriday.com and myadvertiser.com, and you want to be able to track conversions across both of those domains. So those types of requests, you know, is is that a problem or not? Will that like an, uh, allow linkage attacks yes. or something? Yes. Okay. So and so those types of uh, feature requests come up frequently, um, particularly when you have systems that are already built today that you're trying to retrofit. There are a lot of these corner cases that come up. There are a lot of, of these requests that, you know, on the face of them, it's it's not an ad tech saying, hey, can can you just give me all of the information right now? They're making actually a, a very legitimately structured request. They're not trying to to like get away with anything. It is, but it's genuinely challenging for us to reason about how that in, uh, interacts with other partners. I think I'm quite a bit behind where I wanted to be time wise, so I'm going to speed up just a tad. Um, and talk about aggregatable reports. So we just talked about event level, but not everything needs to be at the event level. We have pretty strict rate limits on event level. So in aggregate, you might also want to be able to basically produce tables like this. You want to be able to say, hey, for campaign one, two, three, four, how many purchases did I get? How many add to carts did I get? Um, you might also want to do geography breakdown. And what we allow you to do is actually register in your source and your trigger pieces of keys that allow you to build up you know, perhaps this is uh, campaign one, two, three, four, and this is category shirts, and let you build up these keys and actually do aggregated counts. One of the interesting things here that we have is that instead of doing all of this privacy accounting outside of the device, all of the kind of contribution bounding of making sure that you can't register too many reports for any given user for any given ad event is actually done on the device. So this kind of these cryptic values of, you know, why would you add 32,000 to a campaign count? That's actually a scaled contribution. So we give you, um, I think, 65,000 basically sensitivity units for each uh, individual ad event. And you can spend those basically in any way you like across all of the, the different things that you'd like to measure. Now, as a spoiler alert, this is really complicated for, for ad techs. We, we have not gotten overwhelmingly oh my gosh, this is so simple and I know exactly what to do feedback. It tends to be an area where there's a lot of questions, understandably, because this is thinking about the problem in a very different way than you do it today. So I think to Aloni's question earlier, even if you can do a good job with this, this is very different than, than how you think about doing ads measurement today. This is a substantial shift in the way that you think about like what your data model is supposed to be, when you have to dictate it, and how you think about measuring different goals. So essentially what these reports look like, they're encrypted and we send that batch of, we send encrypted reports back to the ad tech. The ad tech then batches those reports and processes them in a way where we are, are adding the appropriate amount of noise. And because we did all of that contribution bounding on browser, we basically get to add a constant amount of noise instead of having to do any fancy accounting off, off of the device, which turns out to be both uh, convenient and sometimes frustrating. Um, I'm going to skip over Laplace. I'm going to assume that if you uh, if you are here, I'm seeing some nods. Okay, so we're using essentially Laplace noise for, for adding noise here. Um, so what's nice about this, again, no cross-site ID. There's, there's no kind of persistent identifier that's being used for the user. Um, and you have this really, we have this nice classic setting of I'm adding noise to aggregates. That's actually something we, we know how to do. Um, and again, we have a lot of these, these structural limits in place. Now, of course, part of the challenge here um, is that while you can get high accuracy reports, um, it's very different than the way that you, you do it today. So you can get high accuracy reports. You can get like very expressive things like return on ad spend. It's possible to do that in this model. There's a great deal of flexibility, but it's not something that is intuitively obvious to, to most ad techs how to take advantage of it. Um, and there are some legitimate challenges that come up with, with the way that we do this, one of them being key discovery. So imagine that you would like to count conversions per publisher. And so you include a publisher website, a URL, basically, in your aggregation keys. How do you figure out which of those URLs you're going to ask for counts for? 
that, that can actually be somewhat challenging because it's not like everyone, uh, all the ad techs have like a list of all the publishers where they, they show ads and it's only those publishers on the list. It tends to be much more dynamic than that. So there are some legitimate challenges that, that come up here in addition to the um, kind of substantial shift from current practice. Um, so I think uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and skip this to, to get on to the even more open questions because I think this is a bit broader. Um, so really a lot of the open questions that come up in these proposals are how do we reason about these structural protections, like a 30 day limit, three conversions per click versus the more formal privacy protections. I'm running randomized response, what epsilon did I use? How do we think about the interaction between those things? How do we reason about kind of formal definitions when the worst case in the formal definition is actually really bad? And as a spoiler alert, if you have IP addresses coming along with your encrypted reports, your formal privacy parameter is pretty bad unless you're gonna somehow be very confident that the ad tech didn't look at any IP addresses. So there's going to be a lot of challenges here where the structure can be quite good. We can have made a substantial step forward from third party cookies, but we're not quite there in terms of being able to argue the whole system end to end is DP with a really small epsilon, right? Like that, that's not realistically where, where we are today and likely not where we're going to be in, in the short term. Um, another challenge there is, you know, particularly once you're in this setting where your, maybe your epsilon is not great, you start to get an avalanche of feature requests. And if your epsilon is you know, already pretty bad, how much worse is it if you just you know, make it a little bit worse? And you end up in kind of this interesting question of you have to reason about privacy versus utility versus usability. Like it isn't even, you know, I get bad results. It's just, I can't even use the thing unless you, you give me some different feature. Um, and thinking about things like debugging, fraud detection, a lot of these are not going to play nice with formal definitions of privacy. You will need something that says, hey, this is crashing or I'm getting really funky results at an important time of year. I need to figure out what the heck is going on. I have to be able to like break this thing open and see what's happening. So it becomes a very challenging setting to work in because at the same time, you want to kind of hold this privacy bar, but at the same time, you, you are really trying to make sure that you don't then make it so private that it becomes useless or so private that it competes very poorly with or, or it seems on the face of it to compete very poorly with, with things like fingerprinting. So it, it can be a, a very challenging setting to, to work in. Um, and certainly an area where I think more input from the broader privacy community can be really helpful to kind of make sure that we're keeping ourselves honest um, while not letting kind of the, the perfect become the enemy of the good. Um, there are also questions about underlying technology choices, but I think given the, the kind of the focus of this workshop, there's also really a question about how these solutions can enable transparency and who they should enable transparency to. So if you think about third-party cookies, maybe you can tell that a third-party cookie was accessed, but you have no idea what's in it and you don't know what happened to it after it left the device. On the flip side, if you have a platform API, there is potentially a lot more vehicle for transparency there than you might have had with third-party cookie, right? This is an API for attribution reporting. It has a structured notion of a source and a trigger, you know how many reports were sent. So there is great potential for transparency. I don't wanna kid anybody into thinking that somehow you're going to show that report to a consumer and they're gonna make an informed choice about whether they wanna keep this API on, right? Like it's, it's something where, yes, we can provide transparency and certainly in, in relevance use cases where you might have a topics taxonomy, which is actually human readable, that may make more sense to have that transparency to the consumer, to the end user. For cases like measurement, which are very pervasive, transparency can be helpful, but helpful to whom? How should we make this available? And how, how can we help kind of enforce some norms about what level of measurement is or is not acceptable? Okay, so I, I'm at about uh, the five minutes remaining mark, I think. So I want to make a pitch uh, for, for participating. Um, so I, I know that I've just talked about a lot of challenges of platform solutions and how hard it is to, to make all of this stuff work. And that's certainly true. But I am fundamentally optimistic about platform-based solutions, particularly for measurement for a couple of reasons. Um, a big one being transparency. Um, it, it would be very nice as an ad tech to be able to say, hey, I'm using this platform solution which has these transparency properties, so leave me alone. <laughs> like, I'm privacy safe, like please don't come like asking me for a bunch of additional data. Like as long as you're, you're genuinely doing that and you're operating in good faith, it would be very nice to be able to say kind of something simple. It would be very nice to be able to simulate how can things actually impact people rather than kind of knowing something bad could be happening, but I don't really know what. Consistency. Um, 
there is, you know, one of the, the challenges and kind of one of the downsides of fingerprinting is it's probabilistic and you have no ground truth or you have very limited ground truth, very biased ground truth. So I would argue um, that when you think about how well fingerprinting solutions are going to work on Black Friday or on whatever particular holiday of the year or weekend of the year is important to you, your prior observations may have absolutely no power under, under, in that important setting. Right. If you have people kind of churning what devices they're using at a particular time of year, if you have different behavior, people are on different networks uh, at critical times, you, you may or may not be able to actually accurately model these things. So you have this challenge with fingerprinting where there really is no underlying ground truth. So how are you going to convince anybody that your stats are legit? If you have, on the other hand, a platform provided solution, you do have much better sense of consistency, particularly for things like app to web measurement. Um, which we, we haven't talked about in detail, but I'm happy to chat about in the break. Um, if you want to know, I showed uh, an ad in an app and then someone went and purchased it on the web. Today, that's done through kind of, you know, cookie matches. It's done through a lot of offline matching. If instead that's mediated by the platform, obviously with trade-offs, with controls that go along with it, you know when that was available. You actually know your recall for app to web, which would be a substantial improvement over the status quo. And finally, um, there's durability, right? Instead of playing whack-a-mole as kind of anti-covert tracking measures come online from different browsers, from different OSs, instead you have something that's kind of built to work and intended to work. You're using it for its intended purpose, so you have some kind of confidence and durability. So what I really want to in encourage everyone here is, is to join in this conversation. All of these proposals are open. You can see all of them on GitHub. Um, you, you too can be famous uh, on GitHub if you would like to, to comment on, on these proposals. Um, and there, there really is, uh, there has been great uh, participation so far. Uh, I you know, can, can walk you through all of our fun stats and fun colors, um, but these proposals have really been shaped by and continue to be shaped by public feedback, public input. Um, so I, if, if nothing else, if you take really nothing else away from this talk, um, I would encourage you to go look at these proposals, whether you care more about relevance, anti-covert tracking, measurement, um, they're all out there and are really open to, to feedback and open to influence on, on the direction. Um, so uh, with that, I'll wrap it up and uh, take any questions if we have any remaining time. Well, five minutes for questions. Please wait for the microphone if you have a question here or also on Zoom, you can uh, ask questions in the Q&A. Hi, so I, I should probably confess I'm an economist, which is what we try to explain the question I'm about to ask. So the, the way you sort of pitch this is um, you know, we collect too much data now and we're serving these ads and we want to collect less data and continue serving the ads. And of course, by targeting ads better, we increase what we call consumer surplus, right? So, you know, I, I can buy, hopefully, you know, things that I want and that, you know, improves people's lives. How do you think about the costs kind of rigorously of collecting more data? So in particular, there was nothing in your talk that sort of suggested that in fact, you know, less of, less data collection is better in some kind of principled evaluated way, right? So you, 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 you obviously mentioned some reasons for why I do want to collect data, uh, uh, which is so say fraud prevention, right? But that's something that's quantifiable. What about sort of other ways in which you might, you know, what, 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 how do you kind of, as a company, I guess, think about uh, both private and societal costs of data collection? Yeah, great question. In, in, in dollars, right? So, because if well, we can compare them to dollars of kind of um, ad revenue or, or consumer surplus or something like that. Uh, this is a great PM interview question. I might steal it. Um, so I think that, you know, the crux of the question is if, if you had to put a dollar number on like, how, how, what is the benefit of privacy? Um, how would you do that? And, and it's a very challenging question. And I think, you know, I would personally argue that that is a slippery slope to go down. Um, because to a large extent, a lot of the concerns about privacy do end up to some extent boiling down to concerns about fairness. So there's both the sense of, wow, this is really creepy. I'm being followed all over the web and it makes me uncomfortable. It, it makes me less willing to go browse the web in an, in an open fashion. Like it makes me less willing 
to go to different publisher sites. So certainly there is a dollar cost. I'm not entirely sure how you would measure that on the, this is creepy, so I don't want to do it. So I end up concentrating my activity in walled gardens. So I end up concentrating my activity in places that are not open, that are not supporting a, a broad variety of, of perspectives. Um, I think the second piece would be kind of a, a fairness concern, which uh, again, you know, there, there is a cost. It's probably more of a long-term cost than a short-term dollar cost, where if you have um, kind of hyper uh, micro-targeted ads, if you're able to kind of specifically figure out, well, this person's willing to pay this much, so that's what I'm gonna, going to try to charge them, or this person is desperate for this thing, um, that, that, that can be very problematic. So from, from my perspective, the way that I would kind of personally think through this is we have uh, kind of the, do, do we want to preserve the open web? Do we want to preserve open ecosystems? And I would argue that yes, we do. Um, that benefits us as a society, whether we put a dollar number on it or whether that dollar number is something that would manifest in the short term or over a very long term um, is, is I think up for debate. Um, but there, there is inherent value to these open ecosystems and there is inherent value to kind of being able to, to roam without fear. Um, I, I don't know how I would put a cost on someone being afraid to browse a site with medical information because they're worried that then they're gonna start seeing the ads for that thing somewhere else, or they're worried that that's gonna follow them around. I don't know how to put a, a dollar number on that, but to me, it does seem, seem valuable. Thanks. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on uh, the sort of uh, technical problem a publisher or advertiser would face in having a privacy budget for these summary reports, for example? So how, how should one, you, you know, if I were, uh, if I wanted to, you know, optimize some system, how should I think of privacy budgets? What sort of constraint is that? Yeah, it's in, this is a great question. Um, so there, there are a couple of ways this can manifest. One of the, the big ones is how many third parties do I work with, right? I might be working with several ad techs and several third parties to try to measure across the, the scope of all of the ads that I'm running. So that becomes immediately challenging, right? Like how do, how do I split that up? To a large extent, we've dodged that by providing separate budgets. Is that great for privacy? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to argue that it is. Um, but it does help in terms of that measurement consistency. But other challenges you can run into are, I think, um, a sense of, I used to be able to measure everything. I used to be able to look at my entire funnel over a very, very long period of time, um, where I could really follow a person all the way through their journey, let's say for purchasing insurance, which is not necessarily something that you do super quickly, um, but it's very high value, purchasing tax software. So I think the challenge that you have here is really, thinking about your goals as a company versus your goals of each campaign that you run, right? As, as an advertiser, you might have a upper funnel brand campaign just trying to help people know that you exist. Then you may have a much more targeted event campaign or a campaign that's targeted for kind of a specific segment of users. And what you may have thought about in the past is kind of because it was the all you can eat buffet, you measure each one of these separately, they can all have their separate goals there. And there's no competition between them. Like the only competition between them was for budget dollars, which by the way, they fought it out using their measurement results. So they're all used to kind of needing those results to, to make that case. So I think it really is um, the biggest challenge is thinking holistically about your goals as an organization and how you structure your budget that way. And I don't know that there is a, a simple or easy answer to that, right? If like how you should measure brand versus performance advertising when you're, when you're privacy budget constrained, I think would be a, a very interesting open question um, for, for what the right way to think about those two diff very different goals um, are and how to kind of allocate your, your budget between them. All the time for questions. Let's thank our speaker again. about 20 minutes.